Welcome. This is Engaging Process, a podcast video series where art education and art making meet. I am art education professor, Dr. Cam McComb. My pronouns are she, her. In this series, I talk one-on-one with professional artists to gain insight into the thinking, planning, experimentation, and research that becomes part of the artistic process. In this episode, I am delighted to be speaking with artist Dustin London. Dustin, welcome to Engaging Process. Thanks so much for having me. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited for this conversation. Uh, Just to begin, like, do you mind sharing your pronouns? Yeah, he, him. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just don't, I don't know, I like to get right to the point, right? Like, we're going to talk for an hour, so let's start with the most uh, germane question, like, why? Like, why do you make art? Why do I make art? Yeah. Yeah. Well, at this point, I don't know what else I would do with my time (laughs) (laughs) outside of job things. But um, for me, it's it's a space that is kind of um, magic. So, um, you know, there's all kinds of art making, right? 3D, 2D, time based, um, whatever. Um, Working two dimensionally, um, there's this paradox of the picture plane, right? It's a surface that you make things on, right? Um, but it's also at the same time a space that you go into. Um, and so to, to make a mark, to be making a shape, to make anything on that surface, um, that relationship seems to only get more and more complex to me. Okay. Um, and that space seems to be um, a very deep space that opens up beyond the page and goes into like, I don't know, some, some other realm. Yeah. Um, that, that's like, um, a way to like commune with some unknown part of the universe or something. Hmm. Um, so as much as it's also a way to kind of, um, consider the visual things around me um, and how those might inform what I'm drawing. Um, when I go to make something, I'm not referencing something specifically. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just making the work as I go. And so I don't have to um, then align myself with whatever the source material might have been. I'm in a space that just is all its own and that I can just exist in. I see. Um, and so... I don't want to say that it's like an escapist thing um, because it does feel like I'm at the same time expanding into some other territory while at the same time also going farther into myself. That's interesting. Okay, that's interesting. Like <laughs> going in to a space yet going inward. Yeah. And so maybe because that space exists in your mind? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was yeah. what makes it feel inward? Yeah. And yet you're responding in an outward way? Right. And, and the space, the space exists in my mind, but the space also is being created yeah, because in a two-dimensional space. Yeah, because it technically space. doesn't exist on paper, right? Like, right. Like, it's two-dimensional. Like That's the paradox. Well, that's the challenge for <laughs> teaching kids, because you're like, you need to make it 3D, but the, but it's actually not. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, draw that to look real. They're like, but it's not. You hold it's up the paper. It is, it is 3D. It, yeah. look, look how thin it is. <laughs> or to try to get them to draw texture, and it's like, okay, you touch it. There is no texture. Right. It's the yeah, illusion. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. The yeah. illusion of texture. Yeah. Interesting. And we'll get to look at your work here in a second, but um, you know, at what point did you know that you wanted to go into these worlds? I don't know that there was ever like a point, um, but I think um, growing up, um, so my my stepdad um, like carves birds and ducks out of wood. Yeah. Um, and then um, he used to do a lot of like wood burning on the surface of them and would build up their their actual textures. Yeah. Um, and that was really kind of fascinating to me and he, he had a love of birds and we both kind of had the love of birds and looking at birds together and identifying them um and so it was kind of a natural thing in like very on and in, in early on in grade school um i i was uh, fortunate to kind of finish whatever my school work was early and then just <laughs> get I'd, it done We're yeah out. get ready uh, exactly and so i had you know like the bird book from our elementary school library just constantly checked out yeah um and so i would just pull that out and open it up and start drawing a bird on my notebook paper, you know? Well, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. And, there, and it's kind of the same thing. It's like, um, 
you're, you're doing this thing on a surface, but there's kind of an innate pleasure in something all of a sudden like forming into a thing in yeah. a space. Um, and it's also kind of like um, the, the pleasure of uh, replicating too, yeah. right? It's like uh, on a, a basic like technical skill set level, right? It's like, right. oh, I can do this thing. Like I can make that look like that. That's really interesting. Or like when you when you start to play music, when you start to be able to like play a song, yeah. it's like, oh, I love that song. I like how that sounds. Oh, now I can do that. Yes. Um, it's it's like, um, <clears throat> um, I don't know. It's kind of like like uh, finding a, a really um, like wonderful friendship in a way. Manny Barkin was an art educator, really prominent in the field, and he talked about this relationship you're describing as a dialogue. He was a painter, and he said, you know, when you're really engaged with the paint, you recognize that it's a conversation. Yes. So I hear you describing that with your thinking about how you're looking at the birds and then drawing them. And I think it's interesting that your stepdad's making them out of, he's trying to replicate them in real real 3D. And yeah. you're like, oh, I want to go to this flat space and do that. So mm -hmm. it was that's interesting that you didn't just copy him and want to carve them, but you're rendering them in a different way. Yeah, I, I did actually copy him and, and, and do that as well. Okay. Um, but in, in school, I don't have a block of wood and a knife. Oh, sure. <laughs> in math, uh, you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let me get out my... Polynomials, <laughs> okay. What, that reminds me of the cardinal or whatever. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Okay. But, I, but I, I do also think that, um, you know, I, I, I was tending towards being attracted to two-dimensional things to make okay. more than three-dimensional things. I don't know where that comes from. That just seemed to be kind of like built in. Well, and you can carry it in your pocket. I mean, yeah, that's it, right. You that's know, right. you really can just put it, you can do it anywhere. Yeah. Right. On a plane, yeah. train, oh, automobile. I yeah, love where, that. Yeah. Um, and so would it be fair to say that your family was supportive of you being an artist? They were. I feel incredibly fortunate to have grown up in the circumstances that I did. Um, we had no money at all. Yeah. Um, we were very poor. Um, and mm. we, we lived on the end of a, uh, a dead end dirt road. Um, and so I was far out of town. And, you know, as much as when you're a child, you might want to, or a kid, you might want to go play with your friends in town. Oh, you can't, you know, we don't have gas money to go into town or something like that. Yeah. It was really helpful um, to be in the woods and to have to like figure stuff out and like playing um, didn't involve an end game. You know, there was no, it's not like I'm playing this game now in order to do this, this and this to win or whatever. Yeah. It was like, I'm going to like hit this stick on the tree for a while and see how long it takes the bark off, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. or like fold leaves or something like that. Um, and so that combined with the fact that my, my mother was a, a nurse. Um, and then when my um, second brother, my first brother um, under me was born, she decided to stop that um, and stop working, and she wanted to get into to crafts and making dolls, okay, um, and like stuffed things. Um, so that combined um, with my stepdad making these birds, making stuff was around yeah. um, early on, and, and was an important part of the household. Yeah, um, and so it, there was no. I feel fortunate that there was n never a, a sort of like pressure to do something that's gonna be lucrative you know um yeah. like oh you oh you do what you want great that's um, nice yeah because i had the i had i grew up in a creative household where we made crafts we did all kinds of things but when it came time to thinking about college and what to do it was like you're gonna do what what <laughs> yeah, right. how are you gonna make money doing that you know and right. it, you know when i picked art ed they were like wait then at least it was reasonable because okay you're gonna make a teacher's salary sure but i do see lots of folks that um struggle with that in their families like they do. It's less so today, I think, than it was, um, it, you know, in previous decades. But maybe. I might, maybe. I don't know. I don't know either. I, I, yeah. Um, I don't know. Talking to students, I'm not so sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, at the same time, you know, like anyone that's going into something that they want to do, you know, the, the whole like starving artist thing um, is really a myth. Like people figure it out. You know, you're not, yeah. you don't go to like, you know, the local overpass. No, there's the artists, Yeah, you yeah. know, like living yeah. under the bridge or something. Like people find a way through um, and they're probably enjoying their life because they're enjoying the thing that they got to pursue in some kind of way. Not that people don't have to get, you oh. know, side jobs or whatever. Yes. That's a reality. But um, 
Yeah, fortunately, that was that was never a problem. And I was also, um, you know, good in school. So like academically, yeah, I could have done whatever I wanted to. And that was nice too to have options. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seemed like going into the idea of making an artist, that was a, a choice based on what do I really like when I just eliminate every other kind of thing that can go into this choice? What do I like to do the most? Okay. That's what I'm going to do. That's wonderful. Yeah. I hope other people listening would have that same inspiration. That yeah. would be great. Well, let's, you know, let's get into the work because I think we yeah, can yeah. talk about our lives for a long time. Um, you know, so I came to know you. We came into working here at the university about the same time, although I think you'd been teaching at the university longer than me somewhere else. But Somewhere else, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious. Like, so I have an image on the screen here for um, listeners. This is a video podcast series. So if you want to actually see the work we're talking about, you can visit my website, www.drcamcreates.com. And you'll be able to see the our actual conversation there. But for podcast listeners, we're just going to describe, right? I have this painting on um, the screen. And it, let's see, what abstract might be a term. Um, it's a field of shapes. Um, we've got black and white stripes um, moving across at different angles across the canvas. We've got this organic circle up in the left-hand corner. Where it has this uh, graded, um, really interesting color from like, yellow to light green to orange to blue violet and got this radiating color around the edge and then we've got a green um, angular shape in the top right hand corner yeah that I'm sure I've done a horrible job of no, explaining no, 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 what no, we're no, looking no, at, no, at all. but what would you add like so this is I knew you as a painter mm -hmm. and that yet so you I guess what how do you self-identify as um, an artist I, I identify myself as a painter okay yeah so I came to know you as a painter, and we're going to talk about actually some other work that you have sort of shifted away from painting. But um, so you were drawing birds, and then how do you come to this? <laughs> right? <laughs> many, many steps in between, yeah, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> So I don't need all of those steps, right, right, but right. like, like, where did this come from? Um, so and, and what are you trying to do with it? Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, th those paintings um, came out of... Um, well, a series of drawings before them, but in transitioning from those drawings into the paintings, I found it useful to draw in Photoshop ahead of time. Yeah. Um, so I would work these compositions out digitally. Um, and, you know, you get all the, the benefits of um, being able to undo and redo things in oh, Photoshop yeah. and turn layers on and off. And it's like, oh, I can do a thing and not worry about it because I can always undo the thing. Yeah. Um, and so these got built up in Photoshop. And so a lot of their like gradients and the kind of um, luminosity that they tend to have, yeah. I think is a, a direct kind of result of looking at a screen all of the time um, and looking at light being projected, right? And so the images kind of develop along those same lines. Okay. Um, so the comp compositions get worked out ahead of time. Um, and then the painting is mostly um, like an execution of that image with the exception of thinking about how surfaces relate to one another, right? Because the digital image is just like, you know, it's the plastic flat screen. Yeah. Um, paint is stuff, right? And it sure. can be smooth or textured or um, flat or gloppy or um, washes or whatever. And so figuring out um, not only, you know, what the image is doing, but then how different surfaces relate to one another, um, that's part of the fun of making those paintings. Um, so, so would it be fair to say that you're sort of making the outline for the painting mm. in the digital world, but then when you paint it, that's when the conversation happens. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. I like the fact that, you know, I had, wouldn't have considered like, okay, now I can really react to the, to the texture and I want this to pull forward and this seems to want to lay back. I'm going to help it a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the, um, the first part of the drawing, though, I mean, there, there, are two, there are two different versions of a similar process because the drawing is getting figured out over time, too, right? That's yeah. all having to come yeah. together, and that's its own conversation that develops into a sort of template that I would say, yes, is the, is the outline, yeah. um, and then the other thing gets made um, in conversation with it. Well, I think how we set up drawings and paintings is important because we tend to throw white paper at students and say, here, draw something, and we now have the technology to do far more than a pencil on paper. And mm -hmm. so like, what if we had them use their tablets or computers and say, all right, 
you design something and now you're going to translate that yeah. into paint, sculpture, but we could use a much more dynamic place. And you're right, like that ability to just un undo, or I love working, um, there's a teacher program everybody uses called Canva. It's like a clip art thing, you know, but it, I love it because I can design layouts and it lets me immediately copy what I'm doing to another space so I can go manipulate that and my original's intact. Mm, that's nice. So if I go far afield and I'm like, oh, that was a bad idea, I can go back to my original and then start a different iteration. So that where paper, you have to erase everything or start, I don't know. There's so many clunky things about working with paper. Sure, sure, sure. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, so you've made this transition. So this is what I'm kind of excited about. And uh, so we have an image here in studio. Um, this is a, you've been taking, I don't know if you've had one trip. I know you have another trip planned, but you've been going to Japan. And this is an image, a photo you've taken of one of the gardens. And I love, I love looking at this image. And like you talked about the paper being a space you enter. And yet, so now this image, like I'm now looking at this going, okay, wait a minute, here's a door. And you're entering the garden like you just described with your drawings. I'm like, wow, I, I can see it here. So tell us what this is and why Japan? What's the connection there? And how is it influencing your work? And sure. Um, uh, on a side note, the funny thing is um, that you can't see um, on the sides in that image, um, the grid, those are paper. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> right? okay. Like the, the paper um, windows and walls. Yeah. Um, so um, Japanese art had been influencing the things that I've been making uh, for probably 15 years or so. Okay. Um, it started out with um, the 19th and 18th century Yukioe woodblock prints like Hokusai, Hiroshige, um, the way that they would construct an image, um, the gradients of color. Um, that certainly was a big part um, of the gradients that came into the painting. Um, and the gradients just kind of changed because the nature of a, a gradient in Photoshop, you know, it's light. You can say, okay, I'm going to go from blue to yellow. And it transitions from blue to yellow in a very different way than it does when you're working with ink. Okay, um, and yeah. so that's, a, that's an interesting conversation there. Um, but the more, so they were kind of an in, those printmakers. Um, and then it just, it just seemed like one little thing after another. It's like, oh. Look at these teacups. Aren't those amazing? Yeah. Or look at this architecture. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, there's there's some there's an aesthetic, um, not like the same aesthetic underlying everything, but there is like an aesthetic that is related to cultural values um and a relationship with nature um that informed many of the ways that I was thinking about art making. And I I thought well, I, I've never, I've been looking at all this stuff for so long. Why yeah. haven't I gone there? Yeah. Um, so well, maybe you weren't was, ready, <laughs> you know, maybe, yeah. um, yeah. Life circumstances were such that, yeah, um, it would have been very difficult, but, um, but yeah, it was a great opportunity to finally go. And so last time, uh, was my, was my first time and this coming summer will be, be my second time. Oh, wonderful. So you use the word aesthetic mm. and, you know, for <clears throat> listeners new to the arts, that might not be a word they're used to hearing. And mm. there's lots of philosophers, you know, Kant and, you know, the different people who've had these big theories about what we mean when we do describe an aesthetic experience or aesthetics. But as a painter, I mean, how would you define that term? Or how do you on think a, about it? On a, on, a, on a kind of fundamental level, um, the overall visual sensibility of something the mm. way that something feels when you look at it visually right mm. like those shapes do a certain thing um they feel um very light and yeah. happy right yeah. those shapes and colors feel very dark and moody um that's a different kind of aesthetic experience yeah. um do you prefer one over the other or do you play oh, I, with I them like, all i like them all <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 it's, it's like having a vocabulary of these things so um yeah, so here's a work, right? Well, so uh, engaging process, right? I'm interested in looking at your final work, but then like we have the opportunity to like get inside your yeah. mind for a moment, like give us some insight into what we're looking at. So, right, we're looking at a draw. This is a drawing. So um, how would you describe this drawing to people listening? Um, it's a colored pencil drawing on washi paper, which is Japanese handmade paper. Okay. Um that's it. Okay. <laughs> that's that's the materials anyway. Um, 
Yeah, so we're looking at fields of color. Um, this, put this, but what is this called? Oto. Okay. Does that have a particular meaning? It does, um, and this drawing is has a lot of sentimental value to me too. Um, when I when I went to Japan, um, uh, I, I met a pianist, um, and um, like she started following me on st Instagram. Um, she saw my work when I was there. I was like, oh, that's curious, like a yeah. pianist, and so I went to listen to the music. And the the music like was very influential um, to all the things that I made the rest of the time that I was there. It, re it really spoke to me. Um, and so she ended up having a performance at an exhibition of mine, and then you know went to have lunch with her at her space. Um, and there there was um, there is um, a little girl who's now probably eleven years old named Oto, oh. um, and Oto is the word for sound. In Japanese, oh wow! And um, she um, was and is learning piano. So what a name for a pianist! <laughs> That's right. Um, and she brought me the most wonderful drawing to give me when she came to the exhibition as a gift. As a gift, and and the drawing is just like amazing. I should have included. I should have included a version of that. Yeah. Um, but it's a drawing um, of her and her family, and in the bottom portion are all of their knees like looking down, yes. but then the top part is looking out onto some other scene. Okay. And and there's like a repetition of trees, very much like a repetition of keys. Oh, wow. And the word for tree in Japanese is key. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> all, all this coming together. So this, this is a roundabout way of saying that um, this drawing um, was inspired heavily by um, this pianist's music, um, Hiroko, um, and then it got named after um, the little girl because um, she was just wonderful. Um, and that seemed like a perfect way to unite both of those experiences. Well, and you're interested in communing with nature and people and sound. So like, I can see that really being a touching moment. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I love this work and I'm really enamored with like this little it's interesting to watch your work change. So like in the studio, we have three images here and I even um, emailed you at one point, I'm like, could you put these in order? And you're like, yeah, they are in order. <laughs> and I was like, what? So I had to go back and look and there's another series we'll really get into. I'm like, I don't understand. You got to tell me how these are in order. This one is more obvious, I think, because, you know, so how do you know, like, what's your entry point when you started drawing? Like, mm -hmm. how did you start this? And I notice things ebb and flow and some things get covered up and changed, but then you have these little elements that stay the same. Mm -hmm. Like I'm enamored. You've got this little cobalt blue <laughs> square that is just this little tiny square and yet it stays visible the whole time. And then you've got big areas that shift and evolve. So how do you decide what stays and goes? I mean, tell us about this. Mm. Um, things start off um, in a number of ways. Um, sometimes it's just like a, uh, a sort of basic compositional relationship I, I have in my head. Like it might be like, okay, I have a sense um, in my mind that there's like going to be a white shape, a green shape, and a, a small blue shape over here. Yeah. And that will be the start of something. Um, or sometimes I'll start drawing and just say, okay, what haven't I done? Uh, well, I haven't started over there with that color before, and I just start making a shape and start the conversation in that way. Um, in terms of deciding what stays and what goes, it's it's that I yeah that's a hard thing to say yeah um, it all comes down to um, the relationship of any given element with other things. So that little um, blue square um, seemed that that just seemed. Um, perfectly placed. Yes. It seemed like it had its relationship to the, some of the larger shapes. Um, and so other things needed to kind of work around that. And th that little, <laughs> that little square could be kind of the dictator for the large, <laughs> the yeah, large yeah. shapes All as right. they moved around. Or the conductor. Exactly. That one's more the dictator, but okay. yeah, or the conductor. <laughs> I'm just trying to make that piano oh, yeah, connection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, okay. Um, yeah. And how do you, so I, you've got this like iridescent quality. Like I could, mm. if that was wrapping paper, I could see like buying a piece of wrapping paper that has all these different, um, 
once again, you do this thing that makes things glow. Mm. Like, like what, how do you achieve that? And you're working with colored pencils, mm-hmm. colored pencils. Do you have mm-hmm. a favorite brand? I do. Yeah. Um, unfortunately they're the most expensive brand and I, well, I discovered awesome. them in J- uh, Japan. Um, Holbein, which is actually a company that you find uh, everywhere in the U S is yeah. a Japanese company and their colored pencils are just luscious. You know, I think that's important when people are hand children and teens art materials and they try them and they think, Oh, I'm not any good at that. Well, if the material is subpar, mm-hmm. even just simple crayon, I had students say, Oh, I went to big lots and got crayons, not a thing against big lots, but like the crayons they were selling were so wax filled and had little pigment that you're not going to get any decent color on a piece of paper, yeah. even for a five-year-old. Yeah. So um, the fact that you're really looking at a material and using the best quality is going to transfer. Yeah. So how do you capture, I mean, unless it's a trade secret, but like how do you layer or something to get this luminous quality that's so p- part of Beautiful. that part of that is the material. Um, the, that particular paper um, has um, a, a st- and and many washi papers do have have a sort of strange surface in that you, it's like um, like I think of the the old like paint jobs on eighties cars where like they would change as you move around them. Yes, right? yes. Um, that paper will sometimes look matte, and then you shift in the light, and it will look all of a sudden like it is like lighting up. Okay. Um, and so that is part of it. Um, but that drawing in particular, the, the luminosity is coming from the values of all of those patches of color being relatively similar to one another. I see. Um, so if there was a lot more contrast, like there is in some other areas, those areas don't have that sense of light that the, the middle area does with all of the patches of color because their values are similar and they're relatively high values close to the paper. Um, and so when I say value, that might be confusing, but um, value has or color has three basic properties right? Hue, value, and saturation. Yeah. So what the color is, red or green, yeah. um, the saturation refers to how intense it is. It could be, you know, straight out of the tube or the pencil or mixed down with something. And then value is one that people don't think about very often. Like some colors are inherently dark and inherently light. Yeah. So that if you took a, a black and white photograph of purple and yellow next to one another, you'd get something that looks almost black and looks something that looks almost white. And so when you have colors um, where their values start to become similar, that kind of visual phenomenon can start to happen where it feels like they're kind of glittering. So it's really a combination of you having this knowledge and being intentional about it, but then there's also the um, the fact that you know these materials have these qualities, and yeah. so they become the essence of themselves. <laughs> that's right. Oh, and that's then you choose to let them be who they are, right, and, yes. and respond back to your having this conversation with your material. Um, and that idea of teaching value is a hard concept to teach – but it's getting easier, I think, because of digital technology. I think so, too. Because I can have students, hey, if you have a photo, even if they're drawing from a photo, okay, put it in black and white yep. and then just see, does it have a good high contrast? And then how is that relationship? You know, are these colors almost the same in value or are they different? Mm-hmm. And it's a classic example in elementary. They'll want to make a poster and put, put oh, I want to emphasize it and they'll draw the letters in yellow. And I'm like, that is the worst color to use <laughs> because they are virtually the same, you know, in right. terms of uh, intensity, the yeah. value intensity. I I had a drawing student um, in introductory drawing um, last week. We started drawing charcoal drawings with value. And in the still life they were drawing from, there's a a lot of black and white and brown objects because they're easier to kind of turn into value. But then there are red objects. Like there was a bright red apple on something. And one student was like, I don't know what value that is. Yeah. Um, And I I took my phone out, took a photograph of it, put it in black and white. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, that's helpful. Yeah. And it's good because you can think something has this dynamic relationship and then you convert it and you're like, oh, that's really flat. Right. Then, <laughs> like you can't even see the apple because it's the same as the background. Right. Yeah. You might need to throw some yellow or orange in there. Yeah. And pop it out a bit. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So let you. I love that you referred to this whole process as magic, right? So mm. I, I want to get a sense of where this magic happens. So artists have studios and, um, you know, some are, you, you think it's a place you have to rent, that you have to, well, maybe you do, but, or, uh, but it, I think people have the idea that artists go to these outside studios and they go to their place of employment. And the artists I'm talking to are uh, much more modest and they're really creating spaces for themselves. So like, here's an um, image. You've given us a couple images of your space. So just talk us through like what's important to you in your studio and, and what's your dog's name? 
Bruno. 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 <laughs> yeah. He's totally he, oblivious, oblivious to you taking photos. He, I, he's the perfect studio dog. He just wants to go in there and go to sleep. It's yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question again? Well, just tell us about your studio. Like, how have you set this up to be functional for you? Like, mm. I see, you know, you've got this, like, I don't know, this uh, L-shaped space so you can draw, but then you've got everything right there at your left hand so you can just turn and grab a new material. It's near a window. I find it fascinating that you've rigged this lighting system. Mm. And it made me wonder, like, you can't work too late at night, right? Because then you'll never go to sleep. <laughs> but I'm like, how does that lighting system function? Why did you set it up that way? Yeah, great question. Um, so if you have um, harsh, if you want a lot of light to be able to see clearly, um, if you have it all directed on the thing that you're drawing, you're going to get really harsh shadows. Yeah. So that when you draw, you're going to see the shadow of your hand and your pencil over top of what you're doing. Um, so all of my lights are turned, are um, clamp lights um, yeah. rigged up on a system near the ceiling. Yeah. And so then they're um, projected onto the white ceiling, which then reflects all of that light back down into the space. So it's an even light. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. And you've got maybe two strips of this, I think. Yeah. Is there both, another yep. image in here somewhere? Both sides of the studio. Yep. Yeah. And so what are we looking at here, right? I asked to see, like, from your chair, what do you see? And so, like, I see, right, you've got all your pencils laid out there. You have, um, you know, there's some painting materials in the back. And then ha what's happening? Are these works that are done on the wall? Are these works in process? Um, most of those are done. One yeah. of them is in process. Um, and that'll usually be the case. Um, it's nice to have something that's been recently finished because I need to spend time with it and, and look at it more to really fully understand it. Yeah. Um, a lot of times I'll make something and it, it feels good. It feels done, but I won't quite have internalized it yet. And so it needs to stick around because it's going to inform yeah. other things that come after it. And so I have things that I'm, that are in progress and finished on the walls at the same time. Um, in terms of the the space, I need a window. I, some people don't need a window, and I don't know how. I just don't know how. And good for them. Um, I need to have some kind of, and it's not just a light thing. It's it's just like, um, otherwise, like my walls are white and plain, and that's how I like that. Yeah. It's nice to have some situation where there's just other visual things. Yeah. Happening a lot. Um, car, that, random car goes by, somebody's yeah, walking. Yeah. yeah. And just like that kind of extra visual information can be helpful just in like drawing shapes as I go. You know, it's not that I'm taking anything directly, but it just kind of subconsciously is nice to have that there. Um, yeah, I've had great basement spaces in two houses and I just can't function in those spaces because I same. feel trapped. You know, yeah. I need, um, and Robert Rauschenberg talked about, needing a window when he worked, but he saw the television as a window. Oh, interesting. Oh, that sounds awful. Right? <laughs> I, I can't imagine that. But then when you think about his work, all this oh. like chaos and things overlapping and um, one comment jutting into another, I think, ah, okay, well, I can see that. Um, I, I suppose if I turn the volume off and just saw right. images flashing by, maybe, but the yeah, the sound would be too distracting. That does, that does make perfect sense, though. So this image, I love this. So you posted this image on your Instagram site uh, a while back. And I was like, oh, my gosh, tell me about this. So what are we looking at? Like, this is a wall in your studio. And why? what does it do for you? And why are, Why did you set it up this way? Mm, great question. And also, thanks goes to you. Um, because before doing that, I had talked to you about the idea. And you said, oh, yes, go for it. You should do it. <laughs> well, I was good, like, all good. right, great. So I printed out the photographs and did it. Um, so it's... It's kind of like a more um, intentional and extreme version of having a window around. Um, those are photographs from my trip to Japan, yeah. um, photographs plucked from thousands, um, from snippets here or there that were some way visually interesting to me. It could have been the relationship of a piece of architecture to a piece of landscape or the shape of a stone. Yeah. Um, the relationship between one tree and a, a wall, something like that. Um, uh, so I generally um, don't put, put much stock and have never um, in the, the notion of inspiration. Um, for me, the work has just come out of working. Like things, if you, if you do stuff, yeah. <laughs> interesting things will happen um, and you can respond to that and keep going. Um, and I think that kind of old adage of, you know, 90% 
uh, perspiration, 10% inspiration yeah. um, is pretty true. And in my case, it's probably 99 and, and 1%. Um, however, when I was in Japan, I just felt so at home aesthetically yeah. um, and so nourished by everything around me that when I came back to the U.S., um, in Japan and in, in Kyoto specifically, um, everything is very carefully decided upon. Yeah. There's no like position of a tree or a wall or anything that didn't have a very deliberate decision making going into it. Here, um, that's not always the case, right? It's like, okay, um, we have a lot of space. We're going to put a, a, a block that's a building there, a bunch of squares. Okay, we put some rocks around it. We call that good landscaping, whatever. Um, and then nobody tends it. Oh, yeah, exactly. There's trash in there. There's yep. all kinds of debris. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think oftentimes um, there's no aesthetic consideration in the first place um, or like the pleasure of how things artistically relate to one another. Um, but then, yes, after that, there's no kind of maintenance or, or care for yeah. that. Anyway, um, so... What is this we're looking at on the screen? This is uh... ah okay. So um, so that's uh, Matsu Taisha, which is um, a shrine in Kyoto. Um, the garden was designed by Mirei Shigemori, um, who was the prominent 20th century garden designer for Japan. Because many of the gardens that we associate, like the rock gardens, yeah, um, had been made centuries ago um, by other people. So he was a prominent maker. Um, so when I was there. Um, I didn't, I went into the studio from just walking around or going to a temple and looking at gardens and I would just start drawing and it was just flowing out. Yeah. Um, it was the most productive period I've ever had. I couldn't stop drawing when I would go into the studio. So I'd spend a day looking and then a day drawing or yeah. like the morning looking and the night drawing. Um, when I got back here, it was very difficult to make things and that almost never happens for me oh. um, because I was all of a sudden out of that environment. Yeah. Um, and well, the environment's not speaking to you. Exactly. Exactly. And part of that is on me. Like I need to find ways of um, being able to see wonderful, beautiful things wherever I go. Yeah. Um, so having those images around was a way to like jumpstart that kind of pull some of that um, energy back into exactly, your daily life exactly interesting yeah yeah, yeah now when you've been in these spaces it's profound you know we've talked about you know i visited a zen garden uh, in vancouver and mm. at the university of british columbia and i was like walked in I was astounded like everywhere you look i mean there was not a dead leaf anywhere yeah right like everything and i'm a gardener so like i came home and it radically changed and started seeing my yard and my landscaping from a different perspective because mm -hmm. i thought oh my gosh i really can shape and cultivate in every little nuance of the space and mm -hmm. so that's my summer you know it's really joyful but so you see these um spaces and you're inspired by them i think this is a drawing that might have been inspired by your trip mm -hmm. or coming did you do this there or when you came back i did that there yep so it doesn't like help people who are trapped in the mindset that you have to draw things to look exactly the way they come in through your pupils mm. right like mm -hmm. if it looks like a tree then i have to draw a thing that looks like a tree like mm. what are you i mean so you're creating this space but like you're not drawing exactly what you see. What are you mm -hmm. doing? What are you doing? Um, so if we take the tree as an example, um, you can you can draw the way a tree looks and you can draw the way a tree feels. Um, the way a tree feels doesn't need to be the same as the way that it looks. And the way it feels to you. Right. Yeah. It's and that's different all than the subjective. way it feels to me. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this drawing um, was taken from a space called Zen House, um, which was a, a gallery that I ended up showing in, which is a living space um, and um, kind of functions as a gallery space on weekends sometimes from the, the person who runs it. Um, and the architecture was just beautifully open and subtly geometric. Yeah. Um, and so that plays into like these few shapes that go onto the page. Yeah. Um, the, the feeling of walking into a space and it's like, okay, 
large empty wall, like the triangle of the truss up there, um, this like one dark painted wall that's a rectangle. So they all have a very particular relationship to one another. But going into a drawing, if I take that basic idea of keeping it a relatively spare and using very basic shapes um, and colors, color relationships, then that approximates the kind of feeling of that space without replicating that space as it was. So that I can so that I can go into a drawing. Um, part of the reason that I work abstractly is because I want to do whatever I want. Um, it's a kind of freedom. Um, and I, if I am looking at an image or in a space and drawing from that directly, not that that's not good. There's all kind of wonderful, amazing problems that come with that. Um, but I want to go into that drawing space and go wherever I want to. So if I go in with the notion of just having these kind of like basic forms, I can start to put them around and they develop their own life because they happen relative to one another. Because you can take any shape and put it anywhere. That's fine. As soon as you put some other shape in there, they have a relationship. Yes. Right. And yes. they can either feel like very distant from one another yeah. Um, like they really don't want to speak yeah. to one another. They're skeptical. They're, exactly. they're buddies. Exactly. Comrades. Or, exactly. You know, yeah. They can they can feel like they're like, former friends. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. They can feel like they're almost friends. You know, you can put them together in all kinds of ways that feel differently. And I want the um, freedom to be able to make those relationships. So you're in a 3D space, but you're a 2D artist. Mm. So you're sort of like looking at these and. It sounds like you're also sort of initially flattening them mm, yeah. and you're flattening it onto this 2D space mm -hmm. and then recreating your feeling of the space. So like that initial flattening sort of becomes the entry point, it sounds like, for this dialogue then that happens between you and how you feel about being in that space. Right. Yes. That's a good way to put it. Um, so in, in my drawings... Um, and we've got some how this evolved here. Oh too. Yeah. yeah. I should also mention that, um, all the, the shapes, um, that are going in there, they look scribbly. Those are just like on my iPhone. Um, like I'll take a photograph of the drawing yeah. and then go in with an editing tool and like copy that brown color and just see what it might look like if a shape happens there so that I can test things out ahead of time and get basic ideas. That's why it might have been confusing looking at the progression of images that they didn't look in thanks, progression. Thanks, thanks. This is, see, this is why you'd have to talk to the artist. Because I'm like, what am I? First of all, I love the fact that you're documenting daily mm -hmm. or every time you work, right? Mm -hmm. or, yeah, whenever, whenever um, I, I have a pause and I put it up to think about it, I'll, I'll take a photograph, it, photograph of it because I might want to then play around with possible ideas. So, okay, so you might work on it, let's say, three sessions in a row mm -hmm. and you feel um, like you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so you might not photograph it right away. And then it's when you have a pause and you're like, okay, well, let me well, let me see what I think about you. That's when you stop, photograph it. And then, because I'm, I'm looking at these images. So, right, uh, if you're listening, he, we have these three images. And then what happens is, like, I'm looking at the left and there's this, I don't know, it's hard. You know, it's a peachy color. Mm -hmm. Um what is that? A polygon like shape. And then in the next image, it disappears. And so I'm like, okay, is he painting over these? Why is there no trace of the paint? Why, you know, it just looks like that's the same background. I'm seeing the creases. So um, the fact that you're taking an image and then manipulating it on your phone, that's a great idea. And so simple, Is right? it an app or is it just No, it's just the in editing. The photo? Yeah, it's just in, when you have the photo, if you push edit. <laughs> you know, the, the, you know, the table I never draw up. on my photos. No, I never think to do that. I mean, why would you? <laughs> 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 so how did you figure out to do that? Um, because I had worked with Photoshop so long. Sure. I was like, there okay. must be some way to like interact with this image. And actually, that's not even really true. I mean, it's true fundamentally, but, um, you know, I would see photographs that people would post and they have writing on them. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, how did that happen? Okay. You push that button and you can choose colors and scribble and do whatever. But to see it then as a way to say, all right, I'm going to use that as a thinking tool mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. art making. And so are, are these three images, are any of them? So the one on the far right, that's the real thing. That's yes. So you messed around with this whole thing. You got the brown up top and then you're like, okay, I can do something with that. And then bam. Okay. Yep. So, so the, um, the second image where that brown try or uh, rectangle comes into the upper left, that was the thing that felt like that needed to stay Ah. and the other stuff went away. And so, but it ah. needed to change colors. It went lighter. Um, and so that's usually what happens. It's like, okay, there's 
yeah. a few options. One thing will probably come of that. And one step at a time. Now I'll do it again later and play around with so it. So the wavy left on the top, you're like, yeah, your thought, but no, you don't get to say. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's, so it, it, I like this knowing that you do this. Here's another example, too, as it gets closer mm. to the completion. I like that you are being playful. Playfulness is so important. Yeah, but you didn't talk about that until now. So why? Why? How? How is being playful helpful in really coming to the, your final thoughts about your work? Sure. Um, I think um, playfulness. Um, there's different ways to think about the term playfulness, right? Yeah. Um, playfulness oftentimes um, has a, in, well, in certain circumstances, has a, a sort of pejorative kind of um, feeling, like like you don't care. Right. Like, yeah. like nothing matters. Like, oh, I'm, I'm playing. Right. So that there's no critical thinking going on. And I often really re, like because that's real popular in education right now. Uh, we need to focus on play. And I'm like, guys, no, because I've taught children. And I know if you say go play, then they're throwing things and laughing and carrying on. And I'm like, no, use the word experiment. Mm, yes. Because yeah, yeah. that has an intentionality mm -hmm, to the play. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think it's important to have both. I think it's important mm. to go into something. Um, you can still have critical thinking going on in either circumstance. Um, you can play and just like not be conscious necessarily of all the things that you're doing. Yeah. And there's going to be something really interesting that might come out of that, that later on you can be like, oh, yeah, like and not even know why. Like I did that thing and it felt good. Yeah. Then then step back and think, why did that feel good? How can I do more of that? Um, or go into something um, in a playful way that has sort of bounds that you've given that area to play in. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, we put up a lot of pressure on that reflective process with young people and say, you know, well, mm -hmm. but why did you do that? And they'll say, I don't know. And we accuse them of not being reflective. <laughs> right, fact, right. They just might not know. Exactly, exactly. And having an accusatory attitude is that, uh, the wrong way to go about it. It, yeah. it has to be more of a questioning process than like a justification process. Yeah. Right. Because I'm sure, right? I mean, you've been doing this a long time now. I mean, there's got to be things that you d you don't know exactly why you did that. Sure, You're sure. responding to the shape, the mm -hmm. colors of conversation. We say things in conversations we often don't mean right. or or we didn't mean to say it like that. And there it is. So maybe that happens in art making, too. Oh, yeah. And students will often uh, say, especially when they make something abstract and I say, well, why, why did you do that? Um, and they say, oh, I don't know. I wasn't thinking about it. It's like, wait, wait, hold on now. Hold on now. <laughs> There's different kind of thinking. So then what on. do you do? How do you get them to go deeper? Um, to have them, first of all, recognize that the thinking that they are doing is thinking and decision making. So that if you decide to put a color there or a shape there, it may not be a conscious decision, yeah. but you are making a decision. Like you've responded to something. To, you're not just like... You had 150 automaton. colored pencils right there and you picked and, that one. Exactly. Why? Exactly. Well, I don't know. Yeah. And, and well, that's think fine. about it. Go right. think about it. Right. And it's fine not to know. Yeah. Um, but to then like, you know, step back and just like later on and not on the spot, maybe sometimes on the spot. I don't know. But later on, just like reflect on that and just think, well, why did I do that? What are the things that I keep on wanting to do yeah. and not thinking about it? Um, what could be the commonality there? Um, oh, OK. Um, now I can kind of own that a bit so that I can then um, use that toward a more directed goal. Um, as I as I move forward in the future in making things. Yeah, because otherwise you're just making a whole series of one-offs. Yeah, you right, know, right. Which it can be nice, but I think what I've learned by hanging out with a bunch of art makers is that um, you tend to value the ability to go into a process and live there for a little while. Yeah. And see where it will take yeah. where it will take your thinking, where it will take, and in your instance, you know, it's not only about what it looks like, but it, what it feels like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sounds really important to your process. Mm -hmm. It's a, It can be important to have both, though. I mean, it depends on what level you're at and where you're at in your practice and process. Yeah. Like sometimes it's good to do a bunch of one offs. Yeah. You know, sometimes like, all right, like I don't want to have to have the responsibility of like, oh, yeah, you know, the, the pressure of making things that like look look the same or, or whatever, like feel like stylistically similar or something like that. That can be that version of play where you're just like running around. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's like a, a, a version or an example of both kinds of play being important. It's fun to play games that have rules, right? Because yeah. then you get better and better and better. But then it's also uh, 
fun to just try something. Um, it, when I was a kid, talking about you beating on the trees and <laughs> looking at the bark as a kid, like we were always make, um, going outside and then we'd play a game for a while and then we'd say, hey, we're going to make, it would get boring. So we're like, we're going to make up a new rule. Yeah. And now we're going to do it this way with a whole set of rules. And I think we can think about that in terms of art making. Like I'm doing this for a while, but now I feel too restrained by it. So I'm going to allow myself, which is kind of like creating your own set of rules. Like, totally. and, I, and a rule is a has a lot of negative connotations to it, but it also can be a guide. Exactly. I right? just had the same word come in my mind yeah. before you said it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we're on the same wavelength. So here, this is a garden. Now, um, this would be a place you don't see yourself running out to play. Right? No. <laughs> right? This is like your classic sin garden. If you go to the store and you get the the sand and the rake and, you know, like, like that's an oversimplification. I, but like, I, I think everyone would die of shock if they saw that happening. <laughs> right, right. Like you are, this is a zen garden. What do they refer to this there? Like, you know, in um, where you it, were. It's uh, essentially called a dry garden. Um, okay. So a kare san sui um, in, the, in Japanese. Um, so um, dry gardens, um, the, the term zen garden is a Western term, um, which, is, which is fine. No, it's I'm a, so glad to point that out. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so kare san sui, the dry garden, um, they are referring to landscape elements and water through dry elements. So oftentimes when you see that like white sand or white gravel that's been raked, yeah. that's that's meant to kind of replicate like the sea in some kind of way okay. or depending on how it's moving like a flowing river or something like yeah. that. So here, um, these are seen as like islands in the sea. Um, Japan is an archipelago, right? Their identity has to do with sure. things emerging from water. Um, and so all of those gardens that you see that are just like beautiful arrangements of rocks actually all have a very specific reference to um, some either um, real landscape out there or like an archetypal um, idea of landscape. That's um, fascinating. Yeah. And too, like my initial thought was like, well, water, water has all these ebbs and flows and moves and you know, my Lynn captures that in her work, mm -hmm, right? With, mm -hmm. But um, if you're even at a more global uh, aerial perspective, you don't see that. You see this flat, um, then you might just see what <laughs> are the rakes would be the tiny little leaf um, crests of the water breaking. Exactly. You know? And that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, the sense of scale in those gardens Oftentimes, you are you are meant to be seeing something from a much like a, a, a distance that's much farther away, right? Like a mountain will be like, you know, a rock that's like, which is fascinating a foot tall. because they originated the thinking behind this before we ever were in space. Oh yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's fascinating. I'm always fascinated when people. Um, like some of those painters that were painting the clouds, you know, that you think they had to be above the clouds in order to understand that the way the clouds pillow that way, mm. and yet they couldn't fly above the clouds when they were doing that. So, mm -hmm. like, wow. Mm -hmm. So this is the last work you have, and we've got some uh, things to talk about. We have to kind of wind down here sure. shortly. Um, so tell us about this drawing you've created. Lots of yellow, orange, cream. There's this really light, elegant blue that kind of peeks through. Mm. What what inspired this work? What's it titled? Um, this one's titled Plum. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, I was very hesitant to name it Plum, um, because there is um, a roughly spherical shape in there that seems to maybe have a stem, and I don't want. That's not the plum. Right. Exactly. Um, I don't want the title to be like um, like a name game. Yeah. Like now I identify it because as soon as that happens, as soon as we, as soon as we put language to it, right. it's like then then it's like the visual experience can stop. It's like, oh, I, I got it now. Now I can But plum is also about alignment. Sure. Exactly. Right? Like I, you have a plum That's line. That's part of the reason yeah. That, yeah, that that felt okay and that I went for it. Um, yeah. But also just the, the feeling of the word plum in the mouth, like plum. Plum. Right? Like the, the voice kind of opens yeah. up and closes in a certain kind of way. Hmm. The letters look a certain kind of way. Like sometimes I'll make up words just because they sound and feel like the drawing. Yeah. Um, this drawing started so this was recent um so after i'd been back from japan for a good six or seven months yeah um and i think just enough time um to start to kind of get the work back so that i don't need um the other influence all the time but also getting close enough to going to japan where i'm starting to like 
<laughs> build back that um, that inspiration. This this drawing is actually not consciously to start, but very loosely based on some of the um, paintings from an old instructor that I had at the University of Pennsylvania, um, Hitoshi Nakazato. Um, and he had, um, like his work would just involve squares, circles, and triangles, yeah. um, which have like a symbolic meaning in, in Japanese and Buddhist culture. Um, so the idea of like bringing it down to a circle, square, and triangle with other things going on, um, and having those kind of like shift through the space of the the image was the the basic idea that evolved out of it. It wasn't where it started at all. It had a totally different starting point um, that had more to do with the left side on that left image where there yeah. was like some um, line work and gradient stuff and then it yeah. turned into something else. Yeah, and there's different takes on working abstractly. I've, I was taught that um, to step back from a work and turn it sideways, turn it upside down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was taught the trick of putting it in front of a mirror and mm -hmm. seeing it from a different view. And uh, some people said, no, no, you know, if it, it's always meant to be the way you created it, you know, and I, I think you flip this, right? Because like oh, yeah. you, the first images and you're like, ah, I like that circular shape on the top rather than the bottom. So, yeah. And that's part of that freedom. Yeah. Right. Like if I'm drawing flowers, um, I flip it upside down. Well, yeah, <laughs> it becomes something completely new. Right. Well, and um, these images, um, the high def on this screen is really great, much better than my mm. computer screen. Um, like how do you, just as a f skill, right, when you're giving advice to people like using pencil, like how do you capture mm. that sense of texture? How many layers of pencil might you be laying down, for example? Uh, uh, one to ten. Uh, it, it just depends on, on the piece. Um, so... A lot of, I mean, I used to photograph things as did many artists with like, you know, expensive digital cameras. Oh, yeah. And now like yeah. the phone resolution on, you know, for the cameras are, are great. Like I just use my phone camera now. Oh, it's better um, than any SLR we had back in the day. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but they tend to exaggerate contrast, which mm. in general makes images look good. Sure. Um, but when you have like a lot of small marks, it can make that surface feel more textured than it actually is or the difference between the, the mark and the paper. So I often have to reduce the contrast just to get it back down where the that level feels like what the mark is. Um, so there's no re there's no real trick to it other than like having to pull back from it feeling over textured. Ah, and that's back to the aesthetic you're trying to achieve. So mm -hmm. somebody well, might decide to push that range and make it really textured. Yeah. Sure, but that. But I also want the. I don't um, want someone to see the drawing and be like, "Wait a minute, you, you the photograph, um, you know, is a different thing." I want the. I want the photograph to represent the drawing as accurately as possible. Okay, so why talk about that? Like, why are you, who are you who are you showing the photograph to, and why does there need to be like a. I don't know, a similarity between the drawing and the photograph. Why do you care about that? Great question. Um, first off, um, because um, I, I do feel respon like responsible for being honest, for one, you know, like... <laughs> I get it. Like, we're, we're so used to putting images out in the world that have filters on them and, you know, like we, you know, take the blemishes away on our skin and things like yeah. that. And it, I, it, that just really tires me. Um, yeah. And I just I, I just want to be real and I want to be honest. But at the same time, on a, a very practical level, if someone wants to purchase something, they're going to they might be purchasing something online um, and yeah. then they get it. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> that is not at all what you were advertising. Right. Or, yeah. you know, you're going to have a studio visit with a gallerist or whomever, another artist, um, and they get in there. And it's a different conversation than they had with the work when it was a digital image. Well, it's just interesting, though, that you're thinking about how to change the actual real image in order to align with our digital capabilities. Mm, mm -hmm. Like, as our digital capabilities become more um, advanced, I suppose, and mm -hmm. more, uh, I don't know, I was talking to Chris about what's real, you know, what is actually real yeah. when you capture that in yeah. an image. Um that that could also then influence so like you could have the contrast be different in the actual mm -hmm. drawing as the photo allows you that capability to align the two so so back to the dialogue so you're not mm -hmm. only having a dialogue with the paper and the pencil but now you're also having a dialogue with the digital image mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. so that's part of then i guess what you're playing with when you when you're photographing your work you're not just photographing it and saying yep today's work click today's work click you're interacting with the photo 
as an aesthetic replication of that sure. image, I guess, at sure. the same time. It, in addition to playing around and using it as a tool to manipulate and think about and plan, mm -hmm. but also as a representation. That's really... I had never thought about that before. That's really interesting. It's super fun. Yeah, I'll bet it's super fun. <laughs> and then, so you've got this detail shot here that just, um, what, what were, when you show someone a detail of the work, what are you hoping they come away from in the detail? What are you hoping somebody would notice? Sure. Just so they can get a sense of, um, the tactility, maybe more of the paper or just like the mark itself actually. So with a drawing like this, especially when the values of the colors, again, back to the value of color, yeah. all those colors, except for the orange one are very high value colors. It's hard to see what's actually going on. It kind of blends together in that image as a whole, um, much easier than maybe some others would. So it's very important to get on the surface and see like, oh, that color is actually different from that other color yeah. um, more than I would have seen in the entirety of the image. And now I can see the marks a little bit more when they were just kind of blurring together um, yeah. because they're similar colors. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Interesting. Oh my gosh. I feel like I've learned so much about your process and uh, it, I also appreciate hearing about um, growing up and, you know, just being mm -hmm. able to see how you interact with the world and with nature and then how that's influenced your art making, would that be fair to say? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's been fascinating to learn about that. Um, yeah, so I want to be able to leave our listeners with some um, tips that you might offer them, mm, right? Mm, so I want mm. you to think about that for a minute, and then I'm going to um, thank a few people here, and then we'll let you have the last word, if that sounds agreeable. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So this series, uh, Engaging Process, is made possible by uh, the EMU College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Faculty Professional Development Award, which is made possible through a generous gift from the Game Above, which is a group of dedicated Eastern Michigan University alumni with various academic and professional backgrounds. Of course, we're very grateful to Max at Be Now Media for making us look and sound good, and for Grove Studios here in Ypsilanti, Michigan, for providing a really great professional space in order to have this conversation. And um, obviously, I am really, really grateful for my guest artists. Today, I've been speaking with um, Dustin London and uh, really learning a lot about his process. And uh, Dustin, uh, what advice could you give to people, right? Um, I'd like to have you talk to listeners, teens especially, right? Five tips, maybe advice that might help them in expressing themselves through the visual arts. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having me on here. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Um, I've really, really enjoyed it. Likewise. Um, so I never really feel comfortable giving advice to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's like, forget it, Cam. All right, this has been an engaging process. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, I, I just feel like everyone will find their own way. And it's, it's, I, I feel like, why should I tell anyone what they should or shouldn't do? But um, in terms of things that have been helpful for me um, that may be useful or not to other people, um, I think um, getting rid of the idea of expressing yourself um, is is useful. Um, to take yourself out of that equation and pursue the thing out in the world that you're curious about. And that could be a subject matter, that could be a material, that could be a process. Like, oh, I really like, I really like the way this clay feels in my hands, right? Like, yeah. I want more of that to happen, right? And to yeah. let yourself be curious about the thing in the world, whatever that is. Could be people Could or be people. objects. Exactly, doesn't whatever it is, yeah. But you're saying it doesn't have to be so self-absorbed. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, so that's a that can be very difficult when you're a teenager, right? Um, well, of course, the world revolves around us when we're teenagers. Right. I, did, I knew everything. You couldn't tell me a thing when I was like 16. Oh, yeah, right? yeah and now I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 The more you actually know, the more that you realize you don't know anything. Yeah. Um, and so part of that getting rid of the idea of expressing yourself, I think that allows your you to pursue your curiosity and it allows you to experiment um, in a way that's very helpful when you get yourself out of the way. I think oftentimes our ego gets in the way of things that we can mm. be doing. Mm. All right. Um, number two, number two uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. I think Nike you it. said just do exactly. it. Right? Yeah. Okay. Do it. Do work. it. Do it. Work. Um, the the thing that will if you if you want to really pursue this, um, the thing that will make the biggest difference is the time that you put into it. Um, that's the way that you're going to learn the most. You learn by doing. Right. You don't you don't pick up the piano and start playing Bach. 
right? You yeah. you spend years doing scales and whatever else. And I think for some reason, there's the idea that you're either talented or not, um, which is really um, wrong. Which is um, why I really am committed to this podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, because I get really tired by that idea. Some people, yes, they're, they're inclined towards a certain kind of thing or another. Um, but art making, you can learn just like you can learn anything else. You know, it's about time and practice. Yeah. Practice goes a long way. So putting the time in and doing the work, that's hugely important. Um, number three, find other people. Find other people that are interested in the same thing, because if you have a sense of community, you're yeah. going to be much more likely to pursue that thing even more. You're going to feel boosted and supported. Um, that's huge. And there's all kinds of ways to do that. You know, some people like to have, you know, chat rooms online. Some people like to get, yeah. um, you know, find, um, you know, going to a college, for example, that feels like the right program for you. You're going to be surrounded by your peers that are interested in the same things. Yeah. Hugely important. That's great. Um, pursue your influences. So part of that, so go see art. <laughs> all, all art is not, um, three by four inches right, on our plastic right. screen. Yeah. Um, go to the museums. I'm constantly shocked by how few of my students have actually gone to museums despite their proximity. Even um, galleries in a town, yeah, like right. you could be shopping and just float into that gallery. You don't, Museums can be intimidating. Right. Yeah. Any space where yeah. there's art, go and look at stuff. Yeah. Because you will, if you see an image of something, you might be shocked that your experience in front of it is absolutely different than what you thought it might be. Um, but after that, when you find the kinds of things that you like to look at, um, don't be afraid to emulate those things. There's a, a, a stigma around like copying. Yes. Um, and this idea that everyone has to be original all the time. Yes. Um, which is ludicrous. Um, there's no originality. All of us are coming from somewhere. And yeah. the, the sooner you um, accept and take on your influences yeah. um, and emulate those things fully, you will find your way through that and out of that with your own language eventually. But you won't if you don't take those things on soon. Mm. If you, if you mm. keep trying not to do it. Yep. It's, you're just going to like, just be do slower. it. Yeah. Like just I love that it. painting. Just copy it, do yeah. it. And then through that copying, you're going to think, oh, well, I would do this differently. Sure. Oh, then do it. Exactly. <laughs> okay. There yep. you go. Um, finally, um, number five, do what you want. Um, <laughs> Which with, teens really want to do, right? Like do what you want. Yeah. Right. Well, what um, do you mean by that? I mean in life. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, and we, spoke to this before about parents, um, you know, being receptive or not to your choices in life. Um, I grew up around a lot of people, not my immediate family, um, but a lot of people in the community living lives that they clearly did not want to live. Um, they had made choices yeah. because they thought they were the responsible ones, the ones that they were going to, you know, make a career out of or whatever. So that, yeah. so that by the time they're, you know, in their middle age, they're really like just getting through the week so that they can have Saturday and Sunday yeah. um, to do the things that they want, which end up they, they don't even do because they're so tired. They just want to hang out. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's a generalization, but I saw a lot of that and it was a, a, a choice early on that I'm not going to live a life that I don't want to live. Like I've got this, this one life, yeah. um, why? At least here. Yeah. Yeah. And I, whatever yeah, your yeah. views are, yeah, I, yeah. I feel like I have this one life. Yeah. I don't want to spend time, that precious time doing things that I don't want to do. And I would encourage everyone to, to also not do the things that you don't want to do. And choices lead to other choices. Yeah. As soon as you start making choices that you think are the quote unquote responsible ones that aren't what you want to do, but what you think you should do, you're going to keep making those choices. And by the end of your life, you're going to be like, wow, how did I get here? Yeah. It's because all of those individual choices. So start by making the choices um, of doing what you want with your life. That's wonderful. Even if you don't have the freedom or the privilege to do exactly what you want to do, you could even just start real small. That's right. Like That's a right. half an hour in this space with this idea that could lead to then creating the life that you envision for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Wow. Dustin, Dustin London, artist, um, magician, right? You <laughs> like to make this magic happen, but, but there's a deep sensitivity that you bring an aesthetic and a connection to nature and life that I think resonates through 
your personality as a human being, but also through your artwork that I think is really inspirational. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's been so nice to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you for being here. And uh, thanks everyone for listening um, to this podcast. Um, may you go out into the world and engage artistic processes for yourselves. And as Dustin says, just do what you want, right? You want to be an artist? Just start right now and do it. I'm Dr. Cam McComb, and this has been Engaging Process. <laughs>